thank you for the introduction. Um, and also, uh, I would like to thank uh, for the opportunity to, to speak here at the workshop. And today I would like to talk um, about an entrepreneurial notion for systems that, uh, um, that show a low complexity behavior. And um, this is joint work uh, with Tobias Jäger, and I should also say it's still work in progress. Um, and I will start with a rather lang lengthy motivation um, um, why we uh, uh, how we started um, this project and uh, what kind of problem we are interested in and um, and uh, how we can up with the, the notion I would like to define. Then I will give the precise definition, then uh, continue with uh, properties of this notion compared with uh, the normal notion of topolog topological entropy. And then at the end I want to give examples where this notion applies to. Um, okay. So starting point of this project was the so-called uh, GOPI map. Um, this is the map um, on, on the cylinder uh, with a simple rational rotation in the base and a, si a simple monotone map in the fiber to so the uh, tangent hyperbolicus here and uh, the sinus. And this map was introduced um, in 18, uh, uh, 1984 by Kibogi et al. And um, so in 96, Keller proved that for this map, depending here on this parameter sigma, you get for sigma small than two, one continuous invariant graph, namely the zero line. And for sigma uh, bigger than two, you still get the zero line as an invariant graph, but you also get this here. So um, just let me briefly explain what this is. Um, um, so what people call this here a strange non strange non-chaotic attractor. This is an invariant curve that is almost nowhere uh, continuous. And it, has, it is zero here on a dense subset um, in the base. And um, yeah, it has quite a complete uh, it looks quite complicated, and in a previous uh, 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 project with Tobias, we studied the host of dimension and the host of measure of this, of this graph, and, and also the, the, the point-wise dimension of the uh, physical measure in the system. And now I just would like to fix, um, just like as a reminder, So maybe just as a quick explanation. So the tangent of Superbolicus here uh, leaves invariant the zero line. And uh, the sinus here uh, makes a pinching um, at theta equal to zero. So just if you look at the first iterate of a straight line here, you will get something um, that looks like this. Yeah? And if you continue iterate this forward and forward, then you will see more and more peaks. Yeah, and this gives you this picture there. Okay, so why are people studying this map? So first of all, this is a very um, basic map. I mean, you have just this monotone function here um, in x and the sinus in, in theta. So this is very basic, most of the basic examples uh, um, you could, you could come up when you think about the map, so it's interesting to understand it in itself. But um, no? uh, the Gobi map is a toy model for more complicated systems, and uh, especially what you're interested in is uh, this occurrence of the strange non-chaotic attractor of this invariant curve. You would like to understand um, the properties of this of this object, and this is a so-called non-autonomous bifurcation phenomenon. And it's, it's a toy model uh, for maps um, uh, which come from, I mean, more applied problems, like the Harper map or from the uh, quasi periodic driven um, logistic map uh, and Arnold circle map. So these um, uh, are the, the, the maps that, that 
been of more, more interest, but the problem in these maps are they have a um, perturbation with respect to theta that is here, that's not multiplicative, um, it is additive. And this makes it, on a technical level, much more difficult to study these systems. That's, so that's the reason why you first try to understand these systems with a multiplicative um, uh, perturbation. And now, uh, in 95, uh, uh, Pekowski and, and Feudel introduced um, a notion what they called the phase sensitivity exponent to distinguish, uh, to distinguish these two cases between the, the non-strange case, so we have just a zero line as an attractor, and the strange case, so where this object appears. And um, they defined this in this particular setting of a, a quasi periodic forcing. And now, um, since this is just defined for this setting, the, narrow qu the natural question pops up if you can find a general notion of a topological invariant that can distinguish these two cases between this non-strange case and this strange case. And um, the first hint um, that, uh, um, that we have to think of something new is that it's not difficult to show that the topologic entropy for the system is zero for all parameters. So in the non-strange and the, in the strange case. And just to explain you quickly why, why this is, um, you, it's very, it's very, um, um, it's not difficult to show this, and there are several ways to, to, to prove this, but I will show a way here to use the rational principle. And for this you need first Furstenberg, And um, he proved that, or with this proof he, he gave, um, uh, you can show that in the case of uh, quasi, quasi periodic force uh, uh, monotone interval maps, like this map here, ergodic invariant measures correspond to invariant graphs. So each invariant measure is supported of, on uh, each ergodic invariant measure is supported on invariant graph, and each uh, invariant graph um, um, gives an ergodic invariant measure. So um, since we only have two um, invariant, uh, invariant graphs here, we just have two uh, um, invariant ergodic measures, and um, of course the dynamics here on the graphs is isometric to the dynamics uh, on the base of the richest rotation, that means the metric entropy is zero for these uh, ergodic invariant measures, and now use the variational principle, uh, and this tells you that the topological entropy of the system is zero. So there we already see that the notion we are looking for shouldn't fulfill a variational principle. So I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not precise here, but let's say you define a topolo topological notion and an equivalent metric notion, then this metric notion should always assign zero to, um, 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 to, to the ergodic invariant measure. And then if you have a rational principle, this should also imply for the topological notion it should be zero. So there we already see from a conceptual point of view, um, the quantity we're looking for shouldn't fulfill a rational principle. Okay. So, and now before I... Um, define our notion, I would like, I would like uh, to repeat uh, the classical notion um, of the definition of Bowen's entropy. And uh, for this, let X uh, D be a compact matter space, F a continuous map X and Y uh, element in your space. And then uh, we have the classical matrix, the bowen dienerberg matrix. And also just as a reminder, So this is a bone dienerberg matrix. And then um, uh, we say that two points, x and y, are epsilon, epsilon n separated uh, if they are separated with respect to the bone dienerberg matrix. 
and then we look um, at separated sets, and we can do the analog thing for spanning sets, and then we denote the largest cardinality of any epsilon separated set by sep, and correspondingly the smallest cardinality of any spanning set by span f, and then we have that the topological entropy equals the gross behavior of our uh, separating points, or the kinetic of our separating points. And now I want to just briefly um, um, uh, remi remind um, um, the audience uh, on some properties because I would like to compare them, them with our notion. So, the first point is just that you can, the se separating points and the spanning points are comparable with each other. Also, this is a very easy um, observation. This is just the reason uh, because we are on a compact manifold, but it's important. Okay, so everything well known. So we have that um, H of S is the topological invariant. We have uh, the uh, power formula here for iterates of F, and we have also pro a product formula. So, and now, of course, the first approach, if you want, um, if you see that a system has zero entropy, the first thing you could come up with is, okay, then I have to look at um, different growth rates of, of my separating points. So um, I, I'm looking, um, want, to, want to look for sub-exponential polynomial growth rates of my separating point. But they, one has to be careful because already for the tangents hyperbolicus, so which is part here in our copy map, you have this easy observation. If you take two points here with a distance uh, bigger than epsilon, and then you iterate them back n times, then these points are already separated uh, in, in, in epsilon, and this means the number of your separating points already grow polynomially. So already for this simple map, when you look on, on a smaller growth rate, you already get uh, polynomial growth behavior. And of course, this is a map that should still um, have zero quantity, whatever, how you, do, how you define it. So, um, um, so this is the first reason why, why one has to be careful when, when we're looking on, on smaller growth rates in, in your separating points because you immediately start to see transient behavior of your maps. And in fact, what, what you, it's not difficult to show that one wandering point is enough to get at least a polynomial, go, a, a polynomial growth behavior. So this is when you, when you start to think about 
smaller um, growth barrier of your separating points, you immediately have to think about transient behavior. And um, the second point is, you know, um, um, this is more on a conceptual level. When you look on growth rates, um, sub-exponential growth rate, in your topo topological notion here, then of course you should also look on growth behavior in your metric version, so on the metric entropy. And there's, there's a fundamental problem because um, when, when you look at on smaller growth behavior in, in your metric entropy, you can achieve any polynomial growth rate that you want to achieve. So you can always find a partition, measured partition, set that you get a, your polynomial growth behavior. This is, follows from uh, Roker and Slammer, and uh, this also shows you that you have to be careful um, when you look on smaller growth behavior um, in your entropy notions. Okay, so this stops now the motivation, and um, now I should also say, I mean, the approach we choose was not not to find to to make a general overview to get a suitable notion for for low complexity, yeah, and. Um, um, use this as the guiding line. Our guiding line was really this, this example here. So you look at the dynamics of this example, and then you see a certain separating behavior that allows you to come up with the definition that I, want, I would like to present now. Okay, so again, we are in, in the metric setting. We have just the map F and two points in our space and a delta and a nu. And then um, we count um, the uh, occasions when these two points are apart by at least delta, and then we say two points are separated when the frequency um, of the separation is bigger than, than a certain minimal frequency nu. So, um, So the functional we um, how we say that two points are separated is now, is now uh, um, this, this frequency, uh, the, uh, is this object here now. So in the bonn dienerberg metric, you separate by this metric, and here we now separate by this, by this function, by this quantity. And in the same way now, like in the uh, entropy setting, we can define now separating sets and also uh, spanning sets. And then again, we look at the larger scalarity of any separating set and on the smallest scalarity of any spanning set. Yeah, so this is in, in the same way. So, but of course, you have to be careful because this object now, how we separate two points, is not a metric anymore. It, it's the only thing that it fulfills is that it's a, a symmetric. So, um, it's, it's neither unique, zero is neither unique, nor is the triangle equality fulfilled. So, this is not so good, but still. Um, and and um, uh, following from this, in general, the separating and spanning points don't have to be finite. So in general, uh, this don't have to be a case like in the in the entropy case. But we still have this relation, so we still uh, can compare the separating and spanning points. Okay. So, but okay. We cannot, we cannot uh, ensure that these quantities are finite, but okay, let's assume they are finite for any pair of delta nu. Then we can also start to look at the growth behavior of this. So we take our separating points, compare it to a certain growth rate. Then we look here for the biggest exponent, such that we still get here a positive quantity. And then we uh, take the biggest quantity of this with respect to delta. Um, here I should say this limit here doesn't have to exist, so in general you have to 
you have to consider here the lim, uh, lim sup and lim inf, uh, but just for the talk, I just wanted to uh, um, uh, just wanted to use the, uh, the limit here. And um, um, if sep is not finite, then we just set this quantity infinite. Okay, so this is the definition. Um, and also, I should say here, instead of this polynomial gross behavior, you could also look for other gross behavior. And at least some of the general properties I present don't depend here on this uh, polynomial growth behavior. Okay, properties. So now I would like to compare it with these um, um, properties. And the first one is that if G is a topological factor of F, then we have that the uh, new separation complexity of F bounds uh, the new separation complexity of G, and of course, this implies in particular that this new separation complexity is a topological invariant. So this is the first step. So this is the first thing what we wanted. It is a topological invariant. Then, if F is continuous, and we take any M on N, then we get that we have a different power formula, namely that the new separation complexity of FM is the same like the new separation complexity of F. So it really distinguished behavior from the topological entropy case. And it seems like this is something one should look out for when, 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 when you study slow entropy notions, because um, there are also two other papers um, um, where they also uh, study slow entropy notions. Here in this paper, they study really polynomial gross behavior of your classical separation points, where they also found distillation. And here in a more recent paper, they uh, define a slow entropy notion using the Hausdorff definition of bone. And they also get this, um, this uh, relation for, or this formula for the, for the, power, uh, for the power formula. Um, and here, the special thing here is they can show actually a variational, variational principle here. But nevertheless, this seems to be a common pattern when you look for slow entropy no, uh, notions. Okay, and the last thing, uh, the uh, product of formula also holds here. Uh, in this setting, and here I should say this now depends that you look at the uh, specific growth rate of polynomial uh, behavior. But you see it has uh, nice properties comparable uh, to the topological entropy except for the power formula. Okay, good. Then now we want to say something about the finiteness of the new separation complexity, or I should uh, rather say of the separating or spanning points, because in general they don't have to be uh, finite. And in fact, by the results I show now, you will see on each manifold I can find maps that have infinite new separation complexity. So the first three theorem um, tells us um, uh, something about the new separation complexity if I have a weak, ma weak mixing measure um, on my space. So let uh, x, x be a metric space, then I have a borrow measure map and mu, uh, borrow probability measure and assume furthermore that mu is weak mixing and it's not supported on a single point, then you can actually show that the new separation complexity is infinite. So already this very weak notion of complexity implies that the new separation complexity is infinite, so it's very sensitive. And just the idea behind the proof is, uh, is just if, if a measure is weak mixing, weak mixing, then you also have then this is equivalent that um, the product um, measure is ergodic for each, e uh, mu n is ergodic for each n. Yeah? So you can, ins uh, instead of looking on the original system, you can look at product systems and can use there the ergodicity, uh, uh, yeah, come up with a suitable functional, and then use this functional to show that the separating points grow um, arbitrary, and then this is now the measure theoretic setting. Now, of course, you would also like to say something about when the topological entropy is positive. Does this quantity react to? And in fact, um, if you have a, a continuous map with positive, uh, positive to topological entropy, then this quantity is also infinite. So it already shows it's say, the right behavior. It's very sensitive, and it's infinite um, when, when you have positive topological entropy in your system. And this theorem here, I should say, this is a direct consequence um, of a recent assault by Thomas uh, Donovarovich, 
where you prove that positive entropy implies the existence of an uncountable uniform DC2 scrambled set. So maybe people that are familiar with this, um, here the SN, right, this was this counting. you were counting when they're separating. And in this notion of uh, scrambled sets, you actually look when this distance here is smaller than a certain delta, and then, but then you also look at the density of this, and then you can define DC1, DC, DC2, DC3. And um, this tells you also about something, the complexity. But uh, this means also here that these two notions actually have a certain connection, and it's exactly by this theorem here. OK. So now we know when this quantity is infinite. So of course, it would be nice uh, to, to know something about when it's finite, to really say something uh, about certain systems. And for this, um, we will uh, um, uh, restrict to a certain setting, but, but, but what, uh, which allows to give a rich class of systems where, where we can study this notion. So suppose you have two maps, and they're semi-conjugated. Semi we are uh, a map H, and then define these two sets. Namely, um, you take you take your co conjugation map, and then you look at the inverse points uh, um, where, or you look at, at, at the, the points where the fibers of this conjugation map are big. So you take a point X, and then you look at the pre-image, and then you look for all the point X where the fiber is big, yeah? so where it at least contains more than one point. These are these E delta sets. And E is in just a union of these e data sets. So you take all the sets, uh, all the points in, in your space where the conjugacy has, has big fibers. And then we can, have the, we can show the following theorem. So now suppose F is a continuous map and semi-conjugated to an isometry on our space T. And now further assume that the separating points are infinite for some pair delta nu. Then you can show that there exists an invariant ergodic measure that is supported on this set where the fibers are big. So in some sense, it tells you in this setting, the separation happens around the set where the fibers are big. So when you want to have a certain um, separation, you have to be close to the, to the set where the, the, the fibers of your map are, um, uh, are, are not small. And now, of course, you have the theorem what we would still have to, uh, we would like um, to have uh, a statement about the finiteness of our separating points, but this theorem now is a simple cor corollary, namely, assume now you, you take your set where the fibers are big and then you project it down um, to, to the space where your asymmetry lives and assume that the, this projection has measure zero with respect to all invariant measures uh, with respect to G, to, to your isometry. Yeah? Um, then this is this is something here. I think, I mean, everyone has seen or um, is quite familiar with. Namely, uh, you have this fulfilled in Sturmian subshifts uh, and then draw maps and tablet uh, subshifts and also in quasi crystals. So um, so this theorem allows you to find a list of uh, very nice um, uh, uh, class of systems where you can actually study this notion now. And now, in the next part, I would like to um, present the results for or some of the results of the first three um, uh, classes of examples. Okay, so the, f the first is the Sturmian subshift. So, um, just as a reminder, you take an irrational <coughs> number in the unit interval, then you look at the rigid rotation on, on the unit circle. And um, you uh, define a coding map, um, namely that assigns 0 to a point x if it lies in this interval and 1 if it lies in this interval. So the picture is This here is my interval E0, 
this is my interval uh, I1, so 0, 1, minus alpha. And now, um, if my point x lies in this interval, my coding assigns 1, and lies in this interval, it assigns 0. And then you take any point, you iterate it forward, code it in, in a symbolic space, and then you take the closure, and then this object is the Sturman subshift generated by alpha. So you start with a point x, then you iterate it forward, and you code it. Um, you do, do this for every x, take the closure, and this gives you um, the Sturman subshift. And now, classical result is that um, the shift uh, is semi-conjugated semi semi -conjugated, um, to the rotation um, on the circle. And this uh, semi-conjugation has a dense a set where the points have two pre-images. Everywhere else, um, you have just one pre-images. One pre and this means um, and, and, and this uh, dense set has measure zero with, the, uh, natural in, uh, with respect to the natural invent uh, measure, namely the Lebesgue measure. So our uh, corollary applies. And now if you study this further, if you uh, look at the actual growth behavior, then you can show that the new separation complexity of a Sturman subject is one. And just to give you an idea, this is not complicated, uh, when are two points um, um, separated here? What you do is um, you have x and y, and you assume that the image uh, with respect to the conjugation is uh, different. Then Assume you have a pre-image of zero inside this interval, then this is equivalent to Probably not read this. Just taking the inter interval and iterate forward so that you have this setting. And now, since the left interval is in this interval, and the other part of this interval, uh, and the other uh, part of the right uh, part of the interval is in the other interval, the coding of these two points is different. So they have already the maximal distance in the symbolic space. And that means you, the only thing you have to do to, to see if two, point, two points are separated is to count when the pre-image of one of the two points lies in this interval. So what you, what you have to show is that, and this is already the idea to doing this, that the separation here is proportional actually to the distance of these two points. Yeah? So counter often this happened, use wise equivolution uh, theorem, and you already get there. And then this here corresponds then to your new, to the new uh, separation complexity, uh, to, the, to the new linear separation complexity. And this means Yeah, of course, if, if cons corresponds, uh, the, the new corresponds to my distance on the circle, then I can put uh, one over new points in, in my system. So and this gives you then here that the, that the new separation complexity in the system is one. Okay, 
the next example. Then draw maps. Um, also, just a quick reminder, uh, we can associate to each uh, circle homomorphism a rotation number, a real number, in the unit level. And uh, then, according to the classical result by Baron Carré, um, uh, this map is semi-conjugate uh, to a rigid rotation via an orientation preserving map, provided that alpha is irrational. And then by then jaw, we know that this map, uh, this semi-conjugation even becomes a conjugacy when the derivative of f is of bounded variation. And since our notion is a topologic invariant, this already tells us that in these cases, the new separation complexity is zero. So if you're really uh, conjugated to rotation, then it's zero. But uh, now we, uh, the jaw map is now uh, a map where we have a irrational rotation number and we are not conjugated to um, the rigid rotation and there are many of them and what we can prove here is also that the new separation complexity is one and just at least just idea for the for the lower bound this is not difficult to see this So, have, so you have here your wandering intervals um, uh, of your map, and these intervals are projected to points. And now, assume you have here two points x and y, and assume they have a different image under the conjugation. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Let me just make it. Yeah, it's okay. And now, let us assume that we have here a point zeta, such that the pre-image here is an interval, a wandering interval, with lengths bigger than delta. Then we know when, when this point lies between these two points, then also the interval here lies between these two points, and we already have separation by delta. And now again, we do the same thing. We rotate this interval and count how often this point lies in, in this interval. And every time this happens, we get the separation by delta. And this, this, this gives um, already, this is already the ingredient to prove the lower bound for the separation complexity. Of course, you have to be a little bit more careful to, to be precise. You have to take um, three points to three points where, um, with, uh, where the pre-image is, is, is the warning interval, choose the smallest one, and in this picture then you can really assure that you get always um, a separation with respect to the length of the smallest of these uh, intervals. So this is the precise picture. And for the upper bound you have to do a little bit more. You have to find the right functional to look at uh, to, to uh, get an upper bound for the separation of two points. So this is a little bit more complicated, but the, the lower bound, this is a very easy idea. Okay. And in fact, here one can see, at least on a circle, we get a, a dichotomy. Either the new separation complexity is zero, namely when you are conjugated to a rotation, or you just have a, a more smay system, or the new separa separation complexity is one, and it's only one when you have it in draw map. So in this setting, we really got a, an, in, the, in a set of, of circle homomorphism. Um, you get, uh, you get an, um, a simple dichotomy. Okay, and now the last example, a tablet, a tablet subshift. Um, so um, tablet subshift um, are well-studied systems, and I think um, they're most known for, uh, for uh, example, or to, uh, as an example class for many interesting properties with respect to topological and uh, method, uh, measure properties. And I think the most common uh, tablet subjects that people know or sequence actually is the Oxybe sequence, and this was one of the first or even the first system where people showed that 
that you can have systems that are minimal but not uniquely ergodic. Um, so uh, let me explain what the tablet subject is. So consider a finite set. Look uh, on the symbolic space um, with respect uh, to the alphabet A, and then uh, take take a sequence out of the space. Then we say um, a sequence is tablet. Tablet. Um, if you can find for each position k, oops, k a period p such that for all l we have that wk is equal to wk plus p of l. So that means if I have here one, then what I need to find is a certain period such that I always get a one. And correspondingly, um, for all uh, for other pos uh, positions, so um, we don't have something periodic, but something. I mean, in this in this class also for the uh, periodic sequences, but of course what you're interested in are the quasi-periodic sequences. And then you take your tablet uh, sequence, uh, you do the, uh, you shift the sequence, and then you take the orbit closure, and this orbit closure is denoted by sigma omega, and together with the shift, you call this a tablet subshift. So it's just a shift orbit closure with respect to a tablet sequence. This is our the symbolic space we are looking at. Okay, and then. Uh, for now we need some objects before I can state the, the theorem. Um, so uh, we take a period, uh, we take a point out of our uh, tablet subshift, and then we look at the uh, positions in your sequence where we have a, a certain periodic behavior, namely with respect to P. So we collect all the positions in our sequence which have a period P. Then we call P, the period P essential, if um, our positions where, where we have a p-periodic behavior, if this set is not empty and it does not coincide uh, with all the periodic uh, uh, positions for p prime small than p. Yeah? So we really want essential period means that we, when we, we can't find a, a, a lower, a smaller period such we already have, we see all the periodic behavior up, to, up until this point. Yeah? And then um, uh, we define uh, what is the period structure of, of a tablet sequence omega. Namely, you take any sequence of essential periods, and then you say it's a period structure of omega if PL divides PL plus 1. And the union of all the periodic positions is actually all positions. So you can really, by this process of, of filling up your, your sequence, by periodic parts, you really get the whole sequence. Yeah? So this is the period structure. And for each non-periodic uh, tablet sequence, you can find such a periodic structure. OK, a little bit more. So since these sets, P, uh, pair, pair of P omega, are periodic, we can calculate the density. So we just count the position that are filled in. and um, divided by the com complete, uh, by all, by all the uh, um, positions we have. Yeah? This gives you a density. And an easy observation is that if I have a non-periodic tuplet sequence, then these, these densities here are bounded above by 1 minus over 1 over p. Because if it wouldn't be like this, then you would, if you wouldn't have this, I mean, this is just, if you have p positions, then at least one position has to be empty. Otherwise, it would be completely periodic. And then this would contradict uh, your assumptions. Yeah? So this is a very easy upper bound. And then now we um, can finally define the relevant object, namely, uh, um, when you have a periodic structure, these densities are increasing monot 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 in a monotone way. And because of this, we can look at the limits um, of these uh, densities. And if this limit goes to 1, 
then we say that the corresponding tablet subshift is regular. And these regular tablet uh, subshifts have very nice properties. They are, um, uh, they are minimal, uniquely ergodic, and especially there are uh, semi, -co semi conjugated to an isometry on a pseudo uh, de uh, defined compact metric space. Namely, they are semi, -co semi conjugated to the uh, translation by unity on an automata. And, um, and the, the isometry is respect to the natural matrix uh, in the setting. And this isometry now is, uh, has a unique invariant measure, namely the Haar measure of the automata. So the automata is a locally compact group, has therefore Haar measure, and this is invariant. And um, the, the, the semi-conjugacy semi with respect to this invariant measure is almost everywhere invertible. So again, we are in the setting of the Coriolis that I presented, and that means it makes sense to study the separating points. So and then we get this last theorem I would like to, would like to show. So suppose you have a, you have a tuplet uh, sequence, uh, you have a um, tuplet subshift that is regular, and assume you have a pairing structure that you always have, uh, at least one, and then we can show that for all delta and s, the new sep uh, the, separa the growth rate behavior of the separation points with respect to polynomial growth behavior is bounded above here uh, with respect to the natural quantity defining this, this tuplet uh, subshift, namely um, PL plus one, and especially here the density. And just to reduce this, um, to a little more general setting, uh, to a little more concrete form, I have to make two assumptions. Namely, so the first assumption is that um, the growth behavior of, of um, my essential periods is, is bounded, I mean the, the quotient is bounded, so that they don't grow too fast. And the second one, and this is now just to get a more precise estimate, we assume that the growth behavior of our density is like 1 minus 1 over PL to the power of R with R smaller than 1. And smaller than 1 because of the second inequality. We have a certain maximal upper bound that we can have, and therefore we have to choose here uh, r small than uh, 1. And under this setting, this theorem implies then that the new separation complexity of this tablet subshift is 1 over r. So, um, if you can define it for this, yes, it should be, yes. I say, uh, I, no, no, sorry, I have to be careful because it's just a semi conjugacy I don't know. I don't know. Um, it could be, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so, okay, but, okay, let's, let's take a brief look at this result. Um, I mean, this is now still work in progress, but what you can already see in this setting now, we should be able to achieve um, any value for the new separation complexity, at least every value bigger than one. Um, because here as, as small than one, this here is always bigger or equal to, to one. And for example, the question if you can actually achieve smaller values than one is, is, uh, is uh, we don't know at the moment. So this would be interesting if it, if it couldn't be because this would, when you think about complex behavior of Sturman subjects, right? Sturman subjects are the, the uh, Sturman um, uh, sequences are the sequence of the smallest possible poly uh, um, growth behavior in your complexity. And if you would also see something like here, this would be interesting. But also, if you could achieve something smaller than one, this would be also interesting because then you would have this new separation complexity for a certain tablet sh shift is smaller than one. But for the Sturman subjects, we have seen that the new separation complexity was one. So it would actually allow you to look deeper into the complexity of subshifts 
which actually have a, a, com a complexity a ghost behavior that is uh, bigger than, uh, than of the Sturmians. So both things here um, would be interesting to, 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 to study the complexity of sequences. Okay, and now, um, yeah, and now just a last word um, uh, to the last case, um, to the quasi-crystals. Um, this is even more work in progress, but what we, what we can, can uh, see there, um, when you have a, So we actually have to explain it just a little bit. Um, we have to restrict to a certain class of quasi-crystals, namely so-called cut-and-scheme uh, quasi-crystals. So, um, you take a grid. I just want to briefly explain the construction for this. You take a grid, integer grid, and then uh, you rotate this grid. Yeah, by a certain irrational angle. And then you take a certain stripe, a certain, uh, there doesn't have to be a, a, a stripe, it has to be a, a set. Now here it's just an interval, what people call this the window. And then you look, you extend this window, and then you take all the points that lie in this window of this uh, rotated uh, grid and project them down. And this here will give you uh, what people call the loan set. And then uh, with this alone set, you can, uh, in a natural way, can consider a dynamic system. Namely, you take, this, uh, you take these sets, and then um, and then You move them. Um, um, you, t you look at the translations. I mean, this is what you, and you have the crystal. You're always in interested in translation uh, of a crystal, and then you take the closure. And I don't want to precise what I mean with the closure, but there are certain ways to do this in a, in a reasonable sense that you get here an object which is compact, and um, then on this object you you can define an action. Um, and also just a translation. And this is a dynamical system behind such a quasi-crystal, or by this Delone set. And now um, what we see, uh, or what we, what we think we can prove is that we can relate this new separation complexity. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, and now I should say, um, when this window here has a certain regularity property, and namely that when you take the interior and close it, then you get the whole set again. On this condition, on the regularity of this window, you can actually show that the flow that I just ex uh, roughly explained, or this group action, is actually semi-conjugated to a flow. Yeah. So uh, to to and, and this this flow is just a it's just a rotation, just a translation. So we are again in the setting of this corollary. And now what we can, we what we think what we can prove is that the new separation complexity is the upper bound um, is actually the box counting dimension of the, or oh, one minus the box counting dimension of the border of this window. So again, we see, what we see is that we can relate this quantity uh, to the natural object, namely this window here in the system. And um, of course, for starting from there, there are many, uh, Questions then we would like to study, namely, then when which quasi crystals achieve the maximum, and also then can we then relate our quantity, the new separation complexity, to certain uh, uh, um, quantities of of the quasi crystal behind it? So, certain, for example, uh, certain uh, propagation properties um, in this quasi crystal, or, or something like this. I mean, this is completely speculation, but there are immediately uh, questions that, that, that uh, follow up uh, from this observation now. And yeah, hopefully, we, uh, next year we will get it done. And um, with this, um, um, yeah, I would like to thank the audience for the, for the attention. Thank you. <laughs>